It's the return of Kenny Wayne Shepherd. Yeah. <laughs> How are you, buddy? I'm good. How are you? You're not in your garage today. I don't get to see your Mopars. No. I'm not. Looks like you're in a, well, I don't know if that's a real background or not, but that's a very mid-century modern thing you got going on back there. Yeah, I'm in an episode of Mad Men. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> How are you, dude? Where are you? In a hotel room? No, no, this is this is a, a sitting room in my house. A sitting room. Yeah, it has nice little velvet chairs. And oh. Good place. The, the wallpaper is kind of cool, so it's good for background. Kenny Wayne Shepherd has sitting room money. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know that. what else to call it. That's what my yeah. wife calls it. It's her reading room, so I come in here every once in a while. I forgot where you live. Uh, last time I talked to you, is it Nashville? Yeah, south of Nashville, but yeah, been in uh, Tennessee now for four years. Dude, I was just in Tennessee. I shot my special comedy special at the Caverns. Have you been there? Uh, I have not been there, but I've seen lots of stuff from there. Like, it looks pretty freaking cool. Oh, you got to play there, Kenny. It's nuts. Yeah. I yeah, mean, I've seen footage of people playing there. It's not it far is... from me. Yeah, it's in Grundy County, Pelham, uh, Pelham, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Whenever I think of Pelham, I think of Pelham Blue SGs. That's it right there. Yeah, dude. That's a killer color. It's the best, especially when it fades into that green. Yep. It's kind of, yeah, it's a, I'm sorry, I'm moving my table back so I can sit back a little bit. There we go. Yeah. 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 That's how it kind of greens as it ages. And that's because, uh, because the clear coat, you know, I'm not sure what Gibson used back then. I'm assuming it was probably the same kind of stuff that Fender was using at the time. But that stuff, the clear coat yellows over time. And so you have a blue color. And as the top coat, uh, the clear starts to yellow, then that's what makes it that green color. Yeah, it's bizarre because you can get into, uh, you know, nitrocellulose and it could turn a Pelham blue into Inverness green. And you don't really know until you open up like the pit guard or the control cavity. And you're like, Oh shit, this was Pelham blue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is one of my favorite colors on a Gibson for sure. What's your favorite color before we get into the stuff of uh fender? You know, I don't know, man. It's really hard to say, to be honest with you. I mean, the sunburst is just the most, you can never go wrong with the sunburst. And that's both with a Gibson or a Fender. Um, I actually asked them at one point a few years back, like what's the biggest selling color for a Strat? And they said white. Wow. Um, and I guess, you know, Jimmy. different different kinds of whites. I mean, there's Olympic white and then there's like Arctic white and there's bright white. I mean, there's newer colors as well. So my new Strat, like the signature model that I did, we actually took Sonic Blue and we made it into a translucent color. So we created a new custom color out of a out of a classic color. And it almost, some people confuse it for, they think it's a white guitar. When, it, when the spotlight hits it, it really makes it bright, but it's a very, very light blue translucent color. And it's really cool. You know, for me, it changes all the time, but 59 to 62 slab board fiesta red with that green guard that'll fuck me up every time yeah fiesta red is a nice color um i'll you know candy apple red for a custom yeah color for that is a good one um it's kind of a sherwood green color oh, i love sherwood had a telly in sherwood green for a long time yeah it's an unusual color how you doing man you know you're dropping uh dirt on my diamonds volume two that's mm -hmm. pretty it's fucking you know it's interesting you think back to the 70s when people drop double albums you know especially live ones frampton comes to live all these great double live records and then in this day and age of like add and and swiping and scrolling and all of that it's almost impossible to or suicidal really to drop a double album because people won't even dive into the back half of the record. So you're wasting all this great material. Same in the yeah. comedy world In the comedy world. I'm a firm believer of 30 or 40 minutes. 
and then six months later drop another 30 because people will ingest it instead of bypassing it right right yeah totally uh that's exactly right and uh you know i'm still i'm i go one foot in the in the future and one foot in the past you know because i'm kind of a dinosaur in many ways it's like i still make albums with the with the hope that like somebody's going to listen to the whole record from beginning to end you know because because on one hand like with the music it's kind of silly it's like nowadays everything's really geared towards singles again you know it's a single mentality one song at a time because you're right like nobody's going to it's just like it's impossible to think anybody's going to sit down and listen to a whole album, especially like we do a full length, you know, 10, 12, 14, 16 song record. Forget about it. So, you know, if you release them in smaller quantities or even one at a time, then the likelihood of people listening to them and hearing everything that you have to say is more likely. Right. But the problem is, is like an album is a work. It's a body of of material and it's a snapshot of where an artist is at a moment in time. And so it's kind of like you would never release a book one chapter at a time. You just wouldn't do that. And we're still somewhat, even though we're in, a, in the digital realm, the album is somewhat of an analog format. And I believe that it's a story. It's a journey that need that for the listener to be taken on. And uh, and so, you know, it, you can't make a statement of who you are as an artist with one song, you know, you make a statement of who you are as an artist by creating a body of material. And that's an album, one album at a time. And so what I've done is, is I've figured out this is a good way to do that. If I put all, if I just tried to cram all these songs on one record together, which I would never do in the first place, and it was never intended to be like that. But if I did that, nobody would hear half this stuff. So, you know, if we split these up, we make two independent albums, but we make them companion pieces. So we keep the conversation going from the release of the first one into the release of the second one. And we're releasing one song at a time, four songs before each album comes out. Then you get the other four songs. Then we're keeping the conversation going. We're keeping the fans engaged. And with eight song albums, you know, there's legendary legendary albums that were eight songs because that was in the days of vinyl so you can only put four songs per side give or take before you start sacrificing the fidelity of the record so so many legendary albums have eight songs so i'm like eight songs 40 minutes of music people can get in their car they can put that on and they can hear that record before they have to pull over and take a piss right so it's more doable yeah you know all the classics are eight and you forget all about that and also, I think a thing that is uh, forgotten about is the incredible, um, you know, thought that goes into sequencing a record, you know, and I was talking to people recently about take your favorite record, whatever it is, and, and, and just reconfigure it in your iTunes or whatever and see how it throws you off. You're like, oh, yeah, oh, oh, this isn't right at all. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. Remember when people used to do mixtapes? Yeah. Right. Now it's a playlist or whatever. But like, uh, yeah, I'm sure if anybody actually creates a playlist on their own and then they listen to it, they'll they might find. I don't know if they really realize it, but they'll if they're paying attention to their feelings, they'll they'll realize when like one song doesn't flow into the next one, it kind of strikes you the wrong way. And you, even though you actually like both of those songs. It's very true when you're coming up with a sequence for a record, like there's a, a lot of importance on what do you open with? What comes next? How does that flow into this? What are the tempos? What's the journey that you're taking people on throughout the listening experience? I mean, we put a lot of effort into that on all of our records and it's intentional for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I used to talk about when I'd make records, I would put them on the cassette and I'd listen to it while I was driving around. I go, ah, there's three songs in E in a row. It doesn't really flow. And then we would re say, you know, you know, sequence it until you got it just right. And you're like, this feels great, man. And always the, the, you always looking for the perfect opening track and the perfect closing. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, it's interesting doing that with two albums, right. As well at the same time, because at first I was like, I knew I had more than two albums worth of music that I had written and we started recording and uh you know originally I was just like going to put one record out and then later on I would get around to seeing 
what from what we have left what's going to go into the next record and do we need anything and then at some point you know i started listening and one album started taking shape and then i was like okay well here's this record like but then here's this other album and and then trying to make sure that they're both balanced and they both make a, a, a complete cohesive musical statement on their own but that they're also somehow if you were to listen to them back to back that, that they still sound like they belong as as part of a package deal so it was a lot of like a lot of thought a lot of effort put into both of those records and releasing them the way that we did here's my question for you is um you knew that you were going to release both of them so that's a, a tricky situation um because i think back to the masterpiece tom petty's wildflowers and at the time he wanted to do a double album the label said no fucking way you know even back then in what mm -hmm. it was at 92 or something the, the double album was dying but when you were looking at the first record, did you look at it as like, we better hit them with the best stuff on the first record so they'll be interested in the second record? No. No, that's the thing because, so here's the deal. Like I said, I originally didn't, my idea wasn't initially to do a double album. Right. Uh. And and we didn't do a double album in the traditional sense because we didn't put them together and release them at the same time. That would have been a mistake. Right. Right. So I was like, well, how can we do this and have it actually make sense? So we actually, I got the best of both worlds. So we released them separately. So almost as individual albums on their own, but they are companion pieces to the same project. The only difference was instead of waiting a year and a half to release the next album we released the, the the follow up album in less than 12 months and actually in today's world that might have been a, a better thing anyways because you need a constant stream of things to engage your fans with but to answer your question no it's not like well let's hit them with the best that we've got first so that they're so interested in the second one because originally these were two separate releases all together for me so i was just like what's the best thing that makes this a great album and what's the best thing that makes this a great a great album so that when they are released we have what we need to say we made a great record and uh yeah it wasn't like which one's better than the other oh i i understand that but it's also got to be tough to think what makes this the first record and what makes oh. this the tep second record yeah, well, well, exactly. So, well, that's true. And, you know, I was trying to figure that one out, to be honest. So really, to be honest with you, I led with the stuff that I thought was a little more controversial. Like, that's what I wanted to do. Because on the first volume, you have Sweet and Low, which is, I mean, to me, it's like a straight, it's a blues song. It's a modern day it's a modern day, I don't know, I'm a man or right. something like that, you know? Um, it's got like all that kind of old school blues, like chest pounding swagger to it. But we did it with like this hip hop groove, you know? And with we even have like record scratching going on in the background. Right. Some, of our, some of our older fans are like, what's that sound? What is that noise, you know? And I'm like, no, get off my I, lawn. <laughs> I grew up in the age of in the birth of hip hop, you know, yeah. that's like my generation. So, and I grew up listening to everything. So inevitably all this stuff finds its way into my music. We had that, then we had a uh, best of times. I mean, that song, we used one of those 808, those vintage 808 drum machines, you know, and, yeah. and you know, again, that, that's a departure. Like, those sounds you've never heard on a Kenny Wayne Shepherd album before. So I was kind of like, man, let's just like, let's hit people with like, with like the, the craziest stuff we've got. Let's just come out like saying, bam, you know, this is like, you know, some people are like, what are they doing? And other people are like, wow, what are they doing? You know, but that was my intention. And then this one has less controversial sounds on it, but it's maybe a little bit more complex, like, uh, in, in what's there musically on, on some of these songs. It's funny that, that you say that because um, I saw Sturgill Simpson over the weekend 
and he, he's an amazing guy because every record's totally different. He doesn't want to be like, you can't box me in. I'm not country. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm country, I'm rock, I'm R and B, I'm soul, I'm rock and roll, you know, like a hard rock. And it's, it's always great if you can establish, uh, that thing and you look at your audience and they're like, we're willing to take the ride no matter what you do, because we dig you, you know, right. which is well, really cool. And that last record with you actually did that, you know? Yeah. So my fans have been with me for the journey, man. We've got fans have been with us for three decades. And I think that one of the things that I think they appreciate about me is that, is that I'm following the inspiration wherever it might lead. And it's the same thing. Um, you know, I mean, I've done stuff uh, not on my own records. We've never really done any country songs, but, but we've had country influence on some of the songs that we've done. Cause I grew up listening. My dad worked at KWKH when I was a kid. So, you know, that's country radio. And I was, you know, Hank Williams Jr. And, uh, you know, Willie Nelson and Merle Haggard and, you know, so forth and so on. Hank Sr. And I, mean, I grew up listening to all that stuff, along with all the greats of the blues, along with James Brown and, you know, P-Funk and all that, along with, you know, all the early days and the pioneers of the rap scene and everything. So, but I've always followed like the music, wherever the music took me. And I think that my fans appreciate that because what that means is, is like when you hear that Kenny Wayne Shepherd is coming out with a new record. And if you've been listening to him for 30 years, you still don't really know what that next album is going to sound like until you listen to it the first time, as opposed to like some artists, it's like, you know, you're like, okay, well, this guy's like, this guy's country or this guy's blues. And at a certain point, it's like, you kind of know what, to expect even before you've even heard the record but right. like i think fans appreciate that like they don't know which ground we're gonna break next and i've done traditional blues i've done straight rock and roll albums and everything kind of in between uh speaking of straight rock and roll man this track uh long way down fantastic rock song man that's a great one well, so like my fourth album, The Place You're In, was a straight up rock album. That was also coincidentally the first album that I sang lead vocals on the majority of the record. And that was a moment. And what we did was, it's like, you know, we had done rock and blues rock. I mean, but we had plenty of songs that rocked. I mean, yeah, slow Blue rock. on Black's rock. Yeah, yeah, Blue on Black is a rock song. Uh, off that same record, there's a single called Slow Ride, not the Fog Hat song, but that was a rocking freaking song on Live On, uh, In Too Deep, just rocking, you know, just, I mean, we have rocked, but like, but there was always some real elements, obvious elements of blues or blues songs on the records, but we did The Place You're In and that was a straight up rock and roll record. And then we followed that with the most traditional blues project we had ever done with the 10 days out and blues from the back roads. And then we've kind of done that over the years, like, okay, now we're going to go this direction. Now we're going to, and every inevitably sooner or later, we always go back and we'll do, okay, here's traditional blues. And then we go, okay, now we're going on the journey again. And then we'll go back to traditional blues and touch base. Well, that song long way down on this record is to remind people that we freaking rock. And we we rock with the best of them. And that's also setting them up for an album that is to come in the next couple of years, because we did a uh, a rock and roll cover album that's going to come out probably in the next, probably two years from now. Um, but it's a really compelling record and there's some really fun songs on there and there's some really rocking stuff. So we're kind of like just planting the seed. It's like, oh, when they hear that, like, oh, yeah, these guys freaking rock. It's like, oh, yeah, we're going to you're going to get more of that. It's coming up. Wow, man. What, uh, can you say what, what bands or songs you did, man? We did stuff. I, I, what, I mean, we did some things that I, that I feel like you go, okay. But my point was to do songs like where on paper, you're like, what really? Yeah. Like Ken Shepard's doing that Genesis, you know, or right. Billy Idol, you know? Uh, I mean, we did Pink Floyd or maybe that's, maybe that's a little more. Okay. Uh, Maybe that makes sense, but some people they would go Pink Floyd. But the idea was to like do kind of head scratchers, to, because then people are like, what? How, what could this even possibly sound like? And then you hear it, you're like, oh my gosh, this is like great. And uh, and it was fun too because all these songs are like from my childhood. It's all stuff that I grew up listening to, and uh, always that's, wanted. An that's really cool, man.
I yeah. like Sturgill did in bloom by Nirvana and it became yeah. like a hit, you know? So it's really cool to see people where they'll take, um, you know, different types of uh, rock bands, especially when they turn it into their own thing where you're listening to it and they're like, Oh shit, that's white wedding. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. So, you know, certain songs, yes, but historically my approach to cover songs has been, I'm not necessarily always like we did do a couple of these cover songs in a different way. Uh, we kind of reimagined them, but for the most part, historically, when I cover songs, I, I feel like one of the reasons why we're inspired to cover the song is because it's a great song the way that it is. I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel necessarily. And because the song has its own genius. So like what we do is most often we try and retain the spirit of the original, but we in, in, interject our personality into the music and our delivery of that song which fund which just fundamentally makes it sound different because it's us doing it but i don't necessarily want to alienate the greatness of of the original song either but there are a couple that will be on there where we kind of reimagine songs to to varying degrees for sure yeah even if you just change a tempo of something it's interesting to be like like in bloom is really slow you know um there are some people that go way out there. You're right. Like they'll, you know, they'll do like a hip hop beat, no instruments, you know, or whatever. And you'll be like, Oh, what? This is green day. <laughs> you know? So yeah, both ways I do love. I mean, uh, Lenny Kravitz did a Curtis Mayfield song and it was unreal. I think he did. Uh, what did he do? Billy Jack. It was unreal, you know? Yeah. yeah. But, but he also yeah. did a, woman right he did american woman yeah he, he did american woman hit, and he had a big hit with that but he didn't reinvent he didn't it. the song he didn't right. reinvent it but he but he did it in lenny kravitz's way which made it super cool yeah, yeah. absolutely lenny is a soldier out there you you and him. Awesome. i've always i've lo always loved and appreciated him and his music and uh you know it's good to see him still out there doing it yeah absolutely now, I noticed that um, I love album credits and I read them and stuff. So I was going through it. Mark Seliger, uh, mm -hmm. great. One of the best photographers on the planet. And I uh, met him years ago. He shot that crazy classic cover. Uh, well, he's done so many, but Southern Harmony by mm. Black Crows, you know? Yep. And it was interesting. I was in his office and he had like four pictures from that. And it's wild to see just a, a hair different pose. It'll throw you oh, off. Yeah. You'll be like, wait a minute, that's Southern Harmony, but it's not. So pretty cool. Yeah. How did you uh, work with him? And is this your first time working with him? Oh, no. Mark and I go back to my second record, Trouble Is. That's great. So he's done uh, f photography and album covers for me for <clears throat> more than 25 years. Awesome. He's He's a great friend, man, an incredibly talented guy, a very unique individual that, you know, I, I really value his friendship and I value his talent uh, because what he does truly is a talent. And uh, that's actually he's I met Lenny Kravitz through Mark for the first time years and years ago. We did a jam. Mark had a, has a band and he still makes music with called Rusty Truck. Right. When he first got the band together. He was doing a gig in New York and I was in town and he invited Lenny and both Lenny and myself out to the gig. And so we got up and, and played with Mark and his band. And when it came, Lenny obliged and let me play the guitar and he jumped behind the drum kit. Uh, I'm glad too, because he's a much better drummer than I am. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I met Lenny through Mark and uh, Mark and I did really cool stuff. Like, we did a, a gap. I did a commercial for gap clothing back in the nineties, you know, when they had those, they had that really cool uh, advertising campaign where they had all these different cool artists and it was just a solid white black ground background background and, and everything was in black and white. And uh, although I think mine was in color, but anyways, uh, I did, you know, a, com a commercial for gap with Mark. I've done, uh, I mean, multiple, multiple albums. I mean, he's put me, some of our shots that I've done have been in books that he's put out and stuff, but what an incredible guy. Oh my God. He is a, you know, he is a legend and 
you know, if you don't buy vinyl, unfortunately, if you're just streaming, a lot of people don't know these names anymore. They don't know the great producers, you know, uh, they don't know the great photographers. They don't know uh, the engineers. Well, because everybody's a photographer now. Because, every, because we have this, you know, yeah. so everybody, everybody's a photographer. It's like, no, 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 no. This guy's a photographer. Yeah. 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 I, I There's nothing better. My house is covered in rock photography of all the classics. And I've had most of the great, great photographers on the show, Mick rock, you know, people like that. And you're just, you know, that stuff is such a skill. Everybody's a photographer until they see when you go to a gallery, you know, like Morrison hotel gallery and you see these photos, they stop you in your tracks. You're just like, that's Bob Dylan rolling a tire down the East village, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that kind of shit. is just crazy. Jim Marshall. Yeah. I love it. Now, uh, I talked to Leighton a couple days ago. Uh, you do, are you doing the Hendrix, um, tour? Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. When's that start? Starts on uh, Thursday. So a couple of days. Wow. How many dates? Uh, I think I want to say it's like 20 something. I mean, we're out for a month. We're, it's like, I think the first show is September 19th and the last show is October 19th. And who's on the guitars this year? So it's different. Uh, it's slightly different in each market. Um, right. I know the core uh musicians that are doing all shows i'm pretty sure is like me eric johnson zach wild weasel zappa obviously chris layton on drums and uh, my band is kind of the house band um, but there's a number of different artists that are coming and going depending on the market younger artists samantha fish uh yeah, Chris Stone, Kingfish, Ingram, Ali Venable, I think is doing some. I don't have the list in front of me. I don't want to misspeak, but like, yeah. <clears throat> there's uh, but there's some talent and some legendary people that are joining for you know certain shows in certain markets and stuff. Now, how does I've never gone to one of these, and I've always wanted to see one. How does the uh, song selection go? Do you put up a bunch of Hendrix songs? And uh, do they have to be the hits? Does anybody play like Machine Gun or Deep Track, stuff like that? Yeah, yeah people do. Eric Johnson and Dweezil usually will whip out some Deep Tracks here and there. Um, but, you know, it's, I mean, my songs have kind of been my songs. You know, I mean, I end every show I've ever played since I was 15 years old with Voodoo Child Slight Return. So if I'm on the tour, that's going to be one of my songs. We covered I Don't Live Today on my second album. Um, so that's going to be one that we're going to do this year. And then there's a, a, a few more that we're going to do, but um, generally, I mean, it's the people that have been on the tour for years now, like Dweezil and Zach and Eric Johnson and myself, our songs are pretty well established what we're going to do. Eric's doing something different this year. Um, we're throwing in songs that we've done years and years ago and then didn't do for a while. And now we're going to do them again. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see what the new artists who haven't done the tour yet, uh, what they come up with. Now, does your gear uh, differ from the Hendrix tour to the Kenny Wayne tours? Like, do you bring out like a Leslie or anything different stuff, you know, different sounds like, you know, like Hendrix, you know, he played that, I think he played like the super bass yeah. or, well, uh, not for amps. I mean, hit, you know, if you want Hendrix, all you need is a wah pedal, a fuzz face, an octave pedal, Octavia, and a Univibe. Right. And then Strat and, you know, some Marshall amps, but I'm not playing through Marshall amps. But I have all those pedals essentially already on my pedal board, except for the fuzz face. I don't always carry a fuzz face. I love the Univibe. Yeah, the Univibe's awesome, dude. I mean, that's... Really, man, you know, you can get away without having any of that other stuff. If you have a wah pedal and a univibe, you're you're good to go. What's your wah? I love the Clyde wah. I, th I think it's just the best wah made in the last 20 years. What wah do you use? So I have two original 60s Vox Clyde McCoys. Uh, those are my favorite. Um, Custom Audio Electronics, which is actually made by Dunlop. They have a really cool wah pedal that has two different inductors. So it gives you two really different sounds. You just choose which one you prefer. Um, and those are kind of like my two favorites. 
for sure. You know what? Well, I really liked uh, was the one that Dunlop put out with the five selector because you could mm. get like a seventies porn wall, like a whoa, 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 the long throw. Right, you right. can, yeah, you know, you can get the classic uh, Curtis Mayfield. You can get the classic Hendrix, but that wall was fantastic. Yeah, you still have to choose one though because that rotary dial. It's like who's going to drop down on their knees to like you know turn yeah. that in the middle of a show. Um, so yeah, you can have five options, but you still have to kind of settle on one for the show. Yeah, uh, but I mean, there's been a lot of great technology that's come out. I know at the end of the day, everybody's just trying to reproduce the sound of the box Clyde McCoy wall. That's it. And if I'm comparing to the sound of my originals, like they, they don't actually match up to be honest with you. The originals are hard to reproduce for sure. What do you think the difference is that the throw of it, like how, how much it stays on or is it just the tone think, of it? Well, no, the throw, because you can adjust that with that pot, you know, you can go in very easily and adjust that on any wah pedal but no it's the components man they just don't make stuff the way they used to and uh even if it looks the same it's not you know it's not the same it's not exactly the same um a lot of epa stuff over the years has forced changes when it comes to paints and and things that they use in capacitors and stuff like that and it changes the sound and it just kind of is what it is yeah yeah how about the uh, the legendary, I always ask guitar players this. I'm not sure if I asked you last time you were on, which by the way, you're the only guy that's been on twice in a year. I've only had people on, a, you know, two times if they're like somebody I really enjoy, but I was like, oh yeah, I'll have them back on because it's got, you know, another record out. You cut the same record at Muscle Shoals. So uh, at the same time, but uh, I don't remember if I asked you about the, uh, the comical legendary um uh Quan pedal, you know, the prices that it is has reached is hilarious. Well, you know, that's one of the rare things where like I got in to that pedal on the ground floor. So I same bought- here. Yeah. I got mine at retail. The guy yeah. came into real guitars. He's all I'm I'm making these pedals. I go, yeah, fuck it, I'll take one. And then I yeah. sold it for three grand and I thought I scored. <laughs> yeah, so I had bought two. I had a silver one with the horse on it, and I had a gold one with the horse on it from the yeah. first year of production. My silver pedal, I still have, and it's like, I think it's serial number 33 or something. Yeah. 31, 33. <clears throat> Very early pedals. And the store that I bought them at, they were having a hard time selling them because it was a really expensive pedal at the time. Yeah, they were like 300 bucks. Yeah. And... I was like, sure. And to be honest with you, it's like, I've never sold any of my stuff. Although, you know, I got out there now and I'm looking at how much, how much space it's taking up. And I'm starting to think maybe I should sell some of the stuff and get it out of here. Cause I'm running out of space, but I've never sold anything. So like when somebody comes up and says, Oh man, I got this or that. It's, can't even, it's either a complete lie or it's something that grew legs somehow. Yeah. Oh yeah. Someone stole it. Yeah. And so I don't know where that gold clone pedal is. Like, I don't know, man. You know, it could have grown legs at some point. I still have the silver one for sure. Um, I wish I could find that gold one, but who knows, man. Maybe a uh, maybe a guy who used to work for me a long time ago decided to take it with him on, on, on his, part. you know, whenever his day of parting came. I don't know. Yeah. But got in on the ground floor with those things. And uh, yeah, it, who knew? Who knew? I mean, what are they like five grand now or something yeah, like that? Yeah, I saw a six grand one at Carter's, but it was mint unused in the box with the little shitty instructions and that original box. And it was the gold one. I had the gold one. Um, that was the highest I've ever seen them. They've kind of dropped in the last year, like everything in America. But mm-hmm. during that COVID, I got free government money. They were going through the fucking roof. And, you know, and then I think like Joe Bonamassa has like five of them, you know, but, uh, but, um, you know, that's a, that's an amazing, think about the legend of that pedal. You know, I think he even made some more later on and people are like, nah, the originals. <laughs> no, you know, he did. He, he reissued the pedal several years ago. Looks different. It's in a red housing. It's much smaller. 
and he even has a whole message on there about the hype that was created about you know the pedal and that it's not of his making and all that stuff and the reissues have actually gone up like they were i don't remember i want to say though they were like 300 bucks when they came out now they're over a thousand bucks like they're going up too yeah. and you know what's uh, i think it's hilarious is there's a switch on that pedal that says i i don't I'm, I'm getting this slightly wrong but the but the gist is there it's like it has an arrow and it says usually always better and then has an arrow this way for the switch it says usually always worse or something like that you know like <laughs> if you put it in this it's all most likely always going to sound better and it's always going to kind of suck over here but like it just makes me want to put it on that setting you know yeah i felt like that intentionally you know it's funny he put that black goop on it so you couldn't take it apart and find it out. But people eventually reversed engineered it and stuff. It, it's such a cult following that pedal, man. It's like it's unreal. You know, I'll tell you something really interesting. I was shocked when we went back to record my second album again and we did the 25th anniversary of the Trouble Is record. Yeah. So I was in the studio. We kind of did we kind of did a recreation of the album. And we're doing a 30th anniversary of my first album. And we're kind of reimagining several of the songs on that one. But the trouble is one was a recreation. So we got in the studio, I had all the same amps, same guitars, everything. And I was sitting there and I had my original TS-808 and I had my original Klon pedal next to each other. And so I'd listen to the song and I'd start trying to figure out, well, what, what do I need to use to get that exact same sound? And what happened was, Right before we started recording that, my dad sent me a picture that he had found of me in the studio making that record. And I was sitting on the floor with my 61 Strat, and the only pedal that was sitting in front of me was the Klon pedal. Wow. And I was like, if you would have asked me before we made this new version of it, what did you, what pedals did you use? I would have told you that I used the TS-808 Tube Screamer on 99% of that record. But I saw that picture. I was like, wow. And then when I got in the studio, I put the TS-808 and the Klon back to back. And when I went to match the sound on the solos, nine times out of 10, it was the Klon. And wow. I didn't even remember it that way. So like most of the guitar solos, if there's a pedal being used on the Trouble Is record, it's actually the Klon pedal. And I always thought it would have been the 808 because that's what I use live most of the time. That's a tough thing too, because even how many years that's been, 20, 30 years, 30 years, that gear is even more vintage now. So it's going to sound different too. Your pickups, you know, they've got another 30 years of sweat and road and grime. The mm -hmm. the Klon has, you know, the 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 parts inside have aged like crazy. So it's almost even tough to try to emulate that exact, you know. Yeah, but it's easier because I literally had the same exact amps, the same guitar, the same pedals, because I've never gotten rid of that stuff. So you could still hear. I mean, it was an obvious difference between yeah. the Klon and the Tube Screamer. So I was just shocked. I, I had no idea that I used the Klon that much on that record. What was the amp on that record? Uh, it was a mixture. So it was my twin. I had one of the very first black faced 1965 twin reissues that were made, which originally were, was only supposed to be a numbered edition of like 250 or 350 amps as a sticker on the back. It said limited edition Fender twin reverb reissue. And then I guess they sold so well that then it just became a permanent amp uh, that they make. Um, so that twin, I had a, Fender Viber King, like a custom shop amp. Oh, I love those three tens. Yeah, with it, mine's you know, a, Ron Wood. Yeah, mine's a very early one that has the EL eighty four reverb tube, which actually was a a problem, a problematic part of the design that they ended up changing later on. Uh, so those two amps, and then a Blackface original nineteen sixty four Viber verb with a one fifteen JBL speaker in it. Wow. Uh, so yeah. That, that those three amps and my 61 strat for almost all of it uh and those the clon the univibe and the ts808 tube screamer that's fantastic well listen man it was great to talk to you again still got your uh what did you have a hellcat last time i talked to you the white one 
Yeah, that there was that. Maybe the Viper was in there too. But yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, yeah. still got those. Absolutely. Yeah. Mopar or no yeah. car. <laughs> got the Dodge Demon 170 that's in a different garage now. And and now I'm trying to figure out what's the next. My car addiction is like some of my friends' guitar addictions, you know. Yeah. Like I have a lot of guitars, but I'm not like I don't consider myself to be a guitar collector and I'm not always on I mean I, I'm always looking out for something different and unique or whatever that I might not have that might give me a new tool that you know to make a new sound but like my car thing is different level like you know <laughs> yeah I just I used to be there until California insurance just yeah. got ridiculous but yeah Porsche 911s for me bring it on you know dude and I, those I wanna... things are through the roof man they're their values it's they're crazy really all yeah. those air cooled man they're just nuts uh i go to this uh show each year and it just will light you on fire man you go and you see every great porsche ever made and it's just like oh my god and i just yeah. love them they're like a strat they look the same from day one yeah it's that's been that's one of the best examples of a real evolution of a design a yeah. gradual evolution over time instead of no there's no real radical redesigns they really have kept the character of that automobile alive and consistent yeah it's like the rolex submariner you're yeah. like there it is you know all right well hopefully are you playing la on the hendrix thing anaheim oh anaheim yeah i'm gonna turn, come down see whipper and you and check yeah, it out on, yeah, yeah i'd love to see it and uh okay so tour dates kennywayneshepherd.com i'm sure yeah kennywayneshepherd.com kws man i mean facebook instagram i mean those are the two that we're the most active on and yep and the record yeah. comes out september 20th dirt on yep. the diamonds volume two if you haven't heard volume one go back and listen to it right now there's three songs available of the new record right this minute you can hear them it's fantastic and uh it was great to see you again my man Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, anytime, dude. Anytime. And I'll see you in Anaheim. All right, brother. Later, bud.